Howdy. Welcome to another episode of Cannon Calls. This week, this week I have the pleasure once again to chat with the Babylon Bee's very own Ethan Nicole. I interview Ethan about his very brand new, released today, October 29th, fresh off the press, Brave Ollie Possum. Brave Ollie Possum is a middle grade fiction, so for ages 8 to 12 and up, it's a beautiful book filled with illustrations and you won't want to miss it. So without further ado, meet Ethan Nicole. Ethan Nicole, author of <laughs> of uh, Brave Ollie Possum, out now. You can go get that thing. It's still up for pre-order, but we will just we'll just ship it to you. Um, like I said, thanks again for taking time. Yes, Brave Ollie Possum, it's out. This is like my uh, my children's. I mean, this is my first children's book novel. I guess I don't know. I always feel snobby saying the word novel. Literature. Yeah, literature. It's a labor of love that kind of sprung out of writing or reading children's books uh, or reading bedtime stories to my kids. When I met my wife to be, she had two kids. And so I was a, they were my future stepchildren. And at first I was reading them comics off of the iPad and I loved just doing that. And uh, we kind of slowly started reading actual books. And then I started reading, I started realizing that, you know, I could read anything and it was actually kind of fun. They, they enjoyed it. And we started reading older stuff like uh, Grimm's Fairy Tales and Alice in Wonderland, the original Peter Pan, uh, all this stuff, The Hobbit. <clears throat> started reading all, through all the rolled doll books. And the rolled doll books had a big effect on me because the way my kids hung on every word of rolled doll like, and how fun it was to read out loud and and the kind of the wonder uh, when, when I finished the book, you know, um, like BFG, Matilda, and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, they just, they beg for the next chapter, especially for that opening with the golden ticket. But uh, I really wanted to do that. Like, I really wanted to make something like that. I was so inspired. Like, you know, you have these moments where something just really grabs on to you and inspires you and makes you really want to be a part of it. And so I've been making comics my whole life, but uh I love the intimacy of the written word and how it's like you and the author and the author gives you just enough ima- stuff to imagine and then you do the rest. Whereas co- comics kind of spoon feed you every, every image and you don't have to do a lot of your own imagining. Right. And uh, not to insult comics, but I think I, I just had never put that together. And so the other thing that, that appealed to me about it was that I could draw whatever I wanted rather than drawing everything like in comics. So <laughs> All the pictures I really wanted to draw, I could just skip to those. And what I love about this book is it is heavily illustrated. That's one reason it's, I mean, it's 370 pages, but that's because there's like over 200 illustrations in it. Flip through it and almost every page you land on, there's at least one piece of art, if not two. It's a, it's like a real cross between a novel and a graphic novel. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the office yesterday was buzzing, man. We were We were so excited <laughs> seeing it. And like I said, the heft adds to it. And then uh, you're exactly right. Like the pictures throughout are excellent. And I must say, I am uh, I'm slowly just double checking audio for your audio book and making sure there's nothing we got to ask you to to reread or anything like that. And mm. I mean, hands down, I think you've got like a career in reading. <laughs> I mean, it is like <laughs> I loved reading out loud to my kids. I, was, I really enjoyed it. And you know, I, I wrote this book to be read out loud. So I really, like there were elements I really wanted to work into the story, um, specifically thinking this is a book you read to your kids before bed every night, a couple chapters. Right. It's spooky. Like there, there's legitimately scary parts. Like my, I read it to my five-year-old and I remember seeing the fear in his eyes during those first few chapters where, act, where Ollie actually gets, you know, thrown into the cage and caught by the child eating witch. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Oh yeah, and, and I guess that's for for the people who have no idea what we're talking about. That's the, I guess you should give the the basic premise, huh? <laughs> yeah. What? So yeah, start there, and then we'll we'll circle back around. Okay. <laughs> the basic premise is that uh, it's about a boy named Ollie who struggles with fear very badly. Keeps his parents up at, every night, screaming, seeing monsters, and 
when a child therapist shows up at the house uh, promising to, to cure him of his fears, even though she's really strange, he chooses to go with her. And she turns out to be a child eating uh, glorch, which is a goblin mixed with an ogre and a witch. And uh, and so in, in an attempt to escape, potion lands on him and he turns into a possum. Um, but he has to figure out how to navigate basically the scariest situation of his entire life as a possum, this creature who blacks out if he gets too scared. So <laughs> that's the basic idea. Um, and once he turns into an animal, he can talk to animals. So there's this whole other world he enters into in the woods. Totally. And so, so you, as I was saying, yeah. So your kid was terrified. Yes. I remember the look and he goes, it's really scary. Like his eyes were like, he was <laughs> trying not to cry. <laughs> like, he's five. It's, it's a little young for it, but like, I'm like, right. just keep, keep with me. Cause it gets really, you know, and man, he loved the finale. Like he was like jumping. Like that's the best when you read a reading out loud and your kids and just sitting there listening. They're like jumping around the room cause they're spilling so much energy from it. <laughs> Totally. But uh, and that was the goal. Like, I really wanted that secret, happy ending, but I wanted uh, great action sequences, lots of funny, uh, lots of silliness. And also, one thing I love about Roald Dahl, he's really good at doing these moments that are like really kind of gross. Right. <laughs> Just <laughs> hilarious, gross. So the bad guy's hilariously gross. And um, you definitely ach- achieved that, I think, with the uh, with with uh, <laughs> the gl- the glorch. The glitch. Yeah. Nasty. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know, though. I think if we if we put this audiobook out, I mean, kids cannot hear it. I, you're going to disappoint kids across the nation <laughs> because no parent is going to sell it like you do, man. I mean, it is awesome. <laughs> like even when I had a voice you had, ready to go. You had that initial scene when she come when when the gorge comes in to the restaurant and you going mm-hmm. back and forth between the dad voice and her voice was. I mean, primo stuff, man. No, oh, thank you. <laughs> you never know like, if it's actually good. Because, you know, I did I did read it. The, the fun thing was I was reading it originally in my garage, uh, trying to just cover myself with pillows and, like, couch cushions. Right. Yeah, I had a nice mic, but you think your garage is quiet. I was getting it at 4 a.m. recording my audio book. But it was uh, not – once you need it to be absolutely silent, you realize that every time a car passes by – Oh, yeah. You realize how loud people's cars are. You realize that there's a lot of people in your neighborhood that have cars that are way louder than they need to be. And then crickets are are death. So <laughs> I had a cricket one day. It completely took my entire... I had four hours to record or two hours. I couldn't record at all. I couldn't find it. I went and bought a bunch of cricket traps oh, man. at Home Depot and, and put them everywhere. And, and I just realized, you know what? So I gave in and I found a guy locally nearby who has a recording studio. And I think that actually added a lot to the experience of recording because oh, number dude, one, that's awesome. I don't think I knew that. Yeah, uh, shout out to uh, to to Lorenz. I actually put I just put a note on. Have you ever heard of uh, Next Door? It's this app that you can get to know the people in your neighborhood. I just no put a way. note on them. Like, does anybody in the area have a recording studio? Because I really need like isolation. <laughs> wow. And you figure there's always somebody within a certain radius that's got to have their own home studio. And this guy Lorenz so, was around. Yeah, I decided, I decided it was worth it. You know, I, I paid him his fee and uh, went in, and we we actually got it done in four nights. That's so I got nuts, like twelve man. or twelve or thirteen chapters done a night. Were you and, exhausted? Uh, I was energized because he was hanging on it, like he was really into it. It's funny <laughs> on every recording at the end of every chapter, because every chapter is a cliffhanger. Right. You can hear him in the background go, ah. That's like, so funny, man. To hear what happens next. <laughs> Dude, give us his address and we will send him a book if you haven't given him one. I mean, seriously, we'll do it. Cool. Yeah, I will. Um, So, yeah, that really energized me. In fact, I think I had to – I actually went in and like parted out some of my sentences later because I was reading so fast because I was so – I was into it. He was into it. That energized me. And the other great thing about it was when I was recording in my garage, I still couldn't scream and make really loud noises because my two-year-old was asleep on the other side of the wall right there. And the garage doors, paper thin, people outside probably think somebody's getting murdered inside my garage. So once I was able to record an actual studio, when I'm doing the glorch and she's getting furious, like I was able to just kind of just go buck wild. I mean, <laughs> so, even the, you, you had a lot like of fun to record. professional dinging. I mean, man, I opened that audio book and I was like, wow, <laughs> oh, yeah. Ethan did not. Sound effects. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ethan did not mess around. 
we are going to the moon. Well, I, I wanted to do like a some music on the title, but I didn't get a chance to. I want to do a little banjo music, a little oh, creepy man. banjo. So. <laughs> yeah, I did realize when I was reading it out loud for the first time again after I because I did read it to my kids out loud like all the way through two different drafts twice. The first time I read through and I read there's a huge chunk of it that bored the heck out of them. And so I went back to the drawing board basically like the last well, the ending was always pretty good and pretty solid, but it was that I've always had trouble with the portion right after this, the middle story, right before the finale, that third quarter, I find that the hardest to write. And, uh, so I re that's probably the part of the book I rewrote the most. And, and, uh, so yeah, I read, I read it to them. And I needed to read it to them again, so I actually paid them. I was like, "I'll pay you guys like twenty bucks each if you'll just let me read it to you again, It'll be another <laughs> test audience." <laughs> when we have authors come in and record, one of the things they say immediately is like, "Man, I really wish I could go back and rework my prose, having read them out loud." Did you feel like you benefited mm -hmm. a lot from that experience? I mean, just rereading it out loud over and over and over again. Yeah, and I even did that when I was writing it. I would sit there in my little man cave and I would read it quietly out loud because I really wanted it to roll off the tongue. Right. I felt like that was a that was a big deal to me that the sentences were actually fun to say. Totally. Um, totally. We had you on for the Babylon B episode, but we didn't get too much into you personally. You mentioned that you did and do comics and that this was kind of a a jaunt into a different world. Um how did you get started in the world of comics? I I grew up loving animation and comics. I always really wanted to get into animation. I wanted to I, I wanted I love I've always loved animated films. Um started animating what I thought would be like a TV show of my own and I got about 30 days into animating a ton of stuff and the file corrupted. Oh no. And I lost all the work. So I lost tons and tons of work on this animated short I was working on <clears throat> which was supposed to launch my career in animation. And so I decided just to make a comic of it. And, uh, and I'd made other comics because I also, I, I, I knew that that was, you know, back during this time, this is like the early 2000s, late 90s. Yeah, early to mid 2000s. It was like a different time in Hollywood. Like graphic novels, original graphic novels were being bought up like crazy instead of scripts because they were like, you could just flip through it and get like the movie preview. And so these movies coming out that were new properties, uh, brand new ideas, and rather than old ones that are just re reboots and stuff like now. And uh, and so that was my goal was to get graphic novels out there and sell a story that way. But I was such a young new writer, I had you know I really struggled with writing. So anyway, I I gave up on the whole animation thing and you know decided I would rather be the guy telling animators what to animate. I didn't want to sit here and spend you know all this time making a character move his hand from left to right when I could be, you know, blasting out panels of a story. So I got into that. I created um, my first graphic novel was basically like practice. I mean, maybe a hundred people read it. And then I made one called Chumble Spuzz, which was kind of my take on like a Ren and Stimpy show kind of cartoon. It's like gross, immature humor, uh, ridiculous, over, super over the top. Um, short stories, the stories, there's like a few stories in each one. And that got picked up by SLG Graphics, which was a indie uh, publisher that I loved in high school. They did, um, their best known title is called Johnny the Homicidal Maniac. And the creator of that created Invader Zim, which is on Nickelodeon, Joan okay. and Vasquez. So that was kind of where I, I kind of got my start in comics. That launched me into... Um, that, that comic got, uh, an Eisner nomination. The Eisner's like, you know, like the, the, the Oscar of comics, you know, um, right. for, for humor. So that was encouraging. It didn't get read by a lot of people, but it got, or bought by a lot of people, but it got a uh, great, I mean, the reviews were great on it. <laughs> right. So that put me on the map in some way. And I started getting contacted by Cartoon Network, people like that saying, uh, you got anything to pitch for cartoons? So I started pitching. I got my first show optioned, and that's what made me decide to move out to L.A. <clears throat> and I've always done... Where were you before? Oh, I'm from Oregon. So okay. I was up in... Oh, okay. that I time, that. I was up in the Portland area. Uh, I'm from Coos Bay, which is a small town in Oregon. Okay. Do you ever make it back up? Yeah, I go up to see my family. Um, we were just up there. Yeah, we were just up there a few months ago uh, for a big family reunion. Okay. 
we got to plan something to get you all the way up down up up in the chimney of idaho oh yeah i got family in uh in moses lake washington oh so. that's right that's yeah i remember that okay yeah that's that's really easy man I've been there. I've been I've been through uh, Moscow. You guys are in Moscow, right? Yeah, we're Mo- there's no cows in Moscow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I went to a lecture there way back when I was uh you know, I'm good friends with Doug Temple now. At this point I was uh more of just an online fan and stalker. Love it. And he he was speaking at the college there and so I I drove all the way out there just to see him and see and see other friends from online from his his forum back in the day. That's awesome. Well, he was here two years ago, I think, at the last wordsmithy that we did. Um, yeah, I remember just talking about that. It sounds so cool. Yeah, you know, at the at the time, I never like the comic book world to me just looked like the minute I fall down, I'm never going to get back out, and uh, you know, just the endless rabbit hole. When we had Ten April in, then I just started his books, and man, now I'm like way down the rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> reading currently doing Bone. Oh, yeah, Bone's great. Which, yeah, which I heard is, I mean, I think it came out in, like, 93, but, man, I am loving Bone. Mm-hmm. Which I saw net last week, Netflix picked that up, I guess. Yeah. Um, which yeah, is guess. crazy. Cool. Yeah, Doug is, uh, I mean, he's been basically a mentor of mine from way early on, from, like, you know, he, when he created Creature Tech is when I found him. I mean, I knew of Earthworm Jim, but, uh, which he created, but. His graphic novels are all self-contained. They're basically big-budget movies. Right. And uh, each one's a self-contained story. And he has, like, I don't know how many now, like 15 or 20 or some crazy amount. Right. So, he, And that was always – so I was always inspired by that. So I just wanted to – I didn't want to be the guy who just drew one superhero. I wasn't even really into superheroes. I liked telling stories that were bizarre, uh, different, uh, wild, you know, crazy. And so – and then the thing that fell into my lap was Axe Cop, and that's kind of what put me on the map. Yeah, so tell us the story of that. So Axe Cop, for those who don't know, is a it's a web comic that I created with my five year old brother when I was twenty four. So my dad, uh, after my parents divorced, moved away and started a new family. And I decided when I got older that I really wanted to have a relationship with my younger siblings. So I started visiting them more often, as often as I could. My little brother, who was a total surprise. I mean, my dad was like in his, uh, in his like mid sixties when Malachi was born, wow. and uh, we go for Christmas and stuff like that. And so I was there on Chris for a Christmas visit when Malachi was five, and he was asking me to play axe cop with him. And he was playing with this toy fireman axe that he'd gotten from some fireman thing he he went to, where you get like a badge and all this fire fireman gear. And so he just thought that if you had an axe and you're a cop, then you're an axe cop. And I, I was actually going on this trip to take a break from drawing. I'd been kind of working my my behind off on my new comic I was working on at the time. But I got so inspired by this axe cop idea, I really wanted to draw it. And, and so as we played together, it just kind of played out in this really funny little adventure and I really wanted to draw it. So I drew it. I decided to just draw it myself. I drew it really sloppy and quick on my laptop. Um, and then the whole family thought it was so funny. We were crying, laughing at it. <laughs> and it just became kind of a fun escape from, I had been living in the Hollywood area. I just moved there like two years or so before, maybe a year and a half and kind of crashed and burned. I had actually just before that, like, uh, had the two jobs. I I'd actually gotten two jobs, but they weren't they were, they were more like graphic design jobs and they're really draining, but they had both laid me off too. So I didn't have an income and none of my pitches had taken off and the comic I had been working on. I just kind of gave up on it and put it on the shelf and was trying to start a new one. I was really in this rut and it felt good to make this comic kind of just for me. It felt like I was back in high school when I used to make comics for my friends. It was like just for me and for my family. And we, when we were dying laughing at them and I assumed that the reason that we were laughing so hard is because we know Malachi it's an inside joke, you know. Right, it was right. fun just to indulge in this inside joke. So I, after the trip, uh, my friend who used to I used to be in a band with, we made websites together all the time, and he wanted to make a website out of Axe Cop, um, and so did I. Like we were just thinking, like it'd be fun to uh, share them, and then and also because we were working on my my other web comic, which was going to be my first web comic ever, was Bear Mageddon which I'm still doing to this day. It's this comic. It's this epic. You know, it's kind of like a zombie 
sto- apocalypse story, but with bears. And we want we wanted to kind of get it right when we launched it, so we wanted to do a test website. So we did this Axe Cop website, which was just for friends and family to check out and see my my comics. The the legend goes that the, <laughs> after we launched that website, two days later it was entertaining his website of the day, and it was like on Wired, and I was getting you know it just went viral, crazy viral. Could, never saw it coming, and uh, and now it's a TV show, two seasons on. Uh, it was on Fox and FX. Nick Offerman, also known as Ron Swanson from That's Parks right. and Rec, did the voice. That's anyway, huge. it was this wild, uh, wild ride that I went on with that. What year was it that that went on? It was about ten years ago, so it'll be ten years. And I mean, this Christmas will be the tenth anniversary of that fateful, that fateful visit. Oh wow! Do we have a, Do we have something planned? I've, t- I've thought about planning something. I, I, w- I have been thinking about trying to do like a Kickstarter to make like a special edition Axe Cop book, like a big hardcover that has a big collection of everything in it. But I got to like, ha- I need the time and the coordinate. All, all these things take time to coordinate, you know, like an event would be fun too. But I don't even know what I'd do. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think I'll have any, because I don't want, I don't want to stomp on Ollie for Christmas season. I want Ollie to be, totally. so I'm going to let Ollie have Christmas season. And then after the new year, I'll figure something out for X Cop. Well, we appreciate we'll that. <laughs> I love, uh, I saw that the Detroit News said that X Cop is a hoot. So, <laughs> which was a ringing endorsement. And then GQ named the comic their time waster of the day. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that kind of stuff just kept coming in like crazy. MTV. <laughs> I mean, we almost were on, uh, I think it was the NBC morning show, one of those morning shows, the big one where everybody's looking in the window. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, Good Morning America. Yeah. we were. Maybe it wasn't that one. It was one of those big morning shows. Um, so funny. They got a little spooked by having they're, – they're, they're, uh, that's something I learned to make Axe Cop is a lot of these they're, – they're afraid of children. There's all this le- legal stuff that's scary. We actually got uh, – through that, we almost got to do our own Marvel special where we did an alternate – we do an alternate universe by me and Malachi. Wow, I fell through. I think that the it seemed like the lawyers got spooked about, you know, because there's just not when there's not not a precedent for something, right? Then lawyers get spooked, and I don't think there's a precedent <laughs> for Marvel hiring a five year old writer. Or I mean, I think he was probably about six or seven at the time. But that's nuts. So Hall, now at least precedent. Now he's sixteen, a best selling yeah. author. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if Axe Cop counts as bestseller. It never made like any bestseller lists, but it did. It did really well for comics. Right. You know, the minute you start like really looking into like what it means when they say bestseller, you know, yeah, it kind of pops yeah, the bubble, is- and you're like, oh, so really, if like it sold two thousand pre-order, it's it's it goes up there. It gets on the New York Times bestseller. Yeah. Um. I mean, we all know of pastors that have purchased their way there, so you know. Um, oh really. So anyway, okay, nice. you uh, you mentioned Doug Tenable. I wanted to ask if he was as bad as Twitter says he is. <laughs> Doug Tenable is one of my best one of my best friends. Uh, he was the best man at my wedding. Oh wow! Go man, way I back. Know that. Yeah, I mean, I used to when I moved. He he's the guy that got me to move to California. He kept telling me I got to do it. Got to move down. You know, I moved down here. I would go visit, visit this family every multiple times a week generally I'd, I'd come over there we'd smoke pipes together we started a group of gk chesterton nerds reading chesterton every sunday at his house right smoking pipes and drinking scotch and whatever else and uh discussing chesterton and then over time we ended up working together on the uh, abomination uh veggie tales <laughs> reincarnation that we worked on for netflix okay so he was the showrunner on that and then i was uh the head writer and so everybody who says that their childhood was destroyed by that show, that's you know, me and Doug had a lot to do with that. <laughs> Single handedly <laughs> ruining childhoods. Yeah. yeah. And um and that, that show moved him to Tennessee and I I I'm still in LA, so we now live in different states, but we still do we actually do a podcast now called Audio Mullet with our friend Mike Nelson of Mystery Science Theater and Rift Tracks. And uh, we talk about the basic ideas that we have old fashioned uh, beliefs and opinions that are out of style, just like the mullet hairdo. Yeah. And so this this podcast is the audio version of wearing a mullet. You're <laughs> you're so uncool 
for believing these things. <laughs> That's, so I wanted to get to that because we have guys in the office that have uh, binged Audio Mullet nonstop. Nice. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, it's, a, it's a really fun podcast because me and Doug don't get to talk much, so pretty much <laughs> as much as we... We only talk on the podcast like that's it's like it's almost like listening to a phone call. Right. So we, we, we really kind of decided at the beginning we weren't going to censor ourselves or like we weren't going to be talking in a certain voice. We're just going to be ourselves for that. And, and I think it's it's a fun, unique show. I think especially for guys, guys seem to really like it. It is kind of an it's it's niche niche. I never know which way to say that. Yeah. But uh, if that you say either one it, confidently, I think it, it flies. You just have to be confident. Yeah. It's very niche. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the audience, I think, really does lean. It really rings with uh, Christian guys who are t- who are creative or who are at least into are interested in the process of creativity because it's by three guys in the entertainment industry um, and conservative leaning. So that's a you know it's already weird to be in the creative industry and to be conservative leaning and a Christian and a Christian, like a a Christian who is, you know, there's the cultural Christianity where it's kind of more almost like a form of therapy. And then there's uh, the theology nerdy type of Christian who's like interested in the the apologetics and uh, the kind of the deeper stuff like that. And so it's, uh, it's that like, it's guys like that. So, which is a very specific crowd. (laughs) <laughs> so you're saying cis white males is uh, who it's for? Yeah, it is. A, it's very triggering. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. I wanted mm-hmm. to talk to you about Bear Mageddon because that came out. Uh, well, there's Book Bear Mageddon, which is my comic. Oh, uh, Bears which... Want to Kill You. Sorry, why did I just yeah, mess I have those two... up? Yeah, Bears Want to Kill You is my book that came out you... okay. not too long ago. Are those related at all or no? They're only related in that I, I created Bear Mageddon. Um, about a year after I launched Axe Cop, I had already drawn like 30 pages because that's what I had planned to launch. Okay. And I didn't want to just be the Axe Cop guy, so I started doing both at the same time. <laughs> and okay. uh, so I started, and I figured I had some kind of an audience at that time, so try to get as much, you know. And, and Bear Mageddon has been off and on over the years. It's always been more of a passion project. You know, I don't skimp on the artwork. I try to, I try to keep it really. Uh, you know, it's very cinematic and epic, and it, almost everything I draw in that comic is like really hard to draw. Stuff I, I mean, even bears. I hate drawing bears; it's so hard to draw. But <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten better at it. Yeah, you'd hope. You but, know, you know, tanks and crowds, crowds of people being eaten by bears. It's a lot of work to draw that. It is. It's. <laughs> but it's a. Uh, it is like a. It's just. It is. A, you know, once again. Uh, it's about masculinity, really. I mean, you get down to it. It is a com- it's a comedic horror story, much like Shaun of the Dead. It's about these slackers who get caught in this in this thing, you know, where bears are taking over the world. Right. But uh, they end up uh, with this. They find this guy in the woods who clearly uh, has lived out there his whole life. He looks like some kind of Davy Crockett Boy Scout guy who's just carries around salmon and eats them raw. And uh, his name is Dickinson Kildeer. And so these kind of uh, millennial uh, wuss guys who sit around playing video games all day are stuck in Bear Mageddon, and their only hope is this guy who can kill bears with an axe. And so he kind of signifies masculinity, and they're, you know, they're in search of their masculinity. And uh, it's kind of the true, it's kind of the underlying story. I, and I you know, probably didn't realize this until later that I got into really writing it. But uh, for me, growing up in in Oregon, there's really kind of two Oregons. There's like the metrosexual Portland hipster uh, 90s, stuck in the 90s Oregon. And then there's rural Oregon where, you know, it's all rednecks who hunt and fish and and drink beer. So I had a... (laughs) Is it the Oregon that people visit versus the Oregon that people don't visit? Probably. I mean, r- rural Oregon is where you go on vacation in Oregon. And then, you know, Portland and stuff is, it, it just depends. They are two different worlds, though. Yeah. I mean, California is kind of the same. Northern California is much different than Southern California. Okay. But, uh, but yeah, growing up, raised by my mom, um, you know, and I had really thought that uh, I hated the rednecks and I thought they were stupid and I wanted to be this artsy you know, free spirit. And then when I moved up to Portland, I realized that there was, you know, there was its own sort of bigotry going on. And, uh, 
stuck in their ways and uh, tribalism going on there. And so copied in those two worlds. And that's really kind of what Barmageddon's about, like trying to figure out. Because when you're like raised by just your mom, the question of what is a man and what is a man supposed to be is like really go Like you think about it a lot because yeah. the only thing that you have to go off of is your dad who left you. And, uh, and, and you've been raised thinking a man is a bad thing, especially if your mom, you know, my mom was pretty bitter towards men. So you, you know, you, you think you're going to grow into this horrible thing. You don't want to. And, uh, and, and culture too kind of tells you that, uh, it's very anti-man, you know, right. as of late. And so, so yeah, I realized later that that's what Barmageddon's all about. It's like this character who's avoiding becoming a man because it's, considered bad and and in this situation because i i consider like the greatest like symbol of manliness to be willing to punch a bear in the face <laughs> <laughs> and so that's what it, he's in this world where like those who are willing to stand up and punch a bear in the face that's exactly what the world needs and so he's trying to figure out how he can become that because he has to defend his family because no one else will so anyway um, that's probably a longer pitch no, than that's you need perfect to i actually wanted to ask you so as somebody who grew up under those conditions when you moved to Portland what was it so it, it would seem like just he, hearing the start of the narrative and not knowing you now you would just hear like and so I moved to Portland and now mm-hmm. I'm in Antifa uh so yeah <laughs> what what was that emotional distance probably from... was my faith uh, okay. I mean like how did I not end up becoming an Antifa guy yeah or yeah just you you sounded you, you know that you had some emotional distance there yeah. to say like yeah. oh these people are seem just as bigoted just the other direction yeah and they're in, in their own way uh yeah part a big part of it probably was my faith that i came to christ in uh while i was still in in coos bay uh and i had a lot of men who came into my life and mentored me and they were the kind of guys i never would have interacted with being you know mr uh artsy fartsy guy uh you know like the guy one of the biggest most influential guys in my life was my, my young life leader, a guy named Todd, who was a complete jock. Just like, you know, probably if we were, if we had gone to high school together, he would have bullied me, <laughs> but, uh, you know, different worlds. And that's one thing that I came to love about my faith is that you, you know, the other big mentor I had was an old man who I never would have talked to. He's, you know, you don't just sit around talking to old men, <laughs> but we, out to breakfast every Saturday because Young Life, when I became a Young Life leader, they assigned me him as a mentor. And so I go out to breakfast with him every Saturday and he's this prayer warrior. We'd read a, so a couple of Psalms, a couple of Proverbs chapters, and then read something, another selected reading. And we'd, it'd be like a two or three hour breakfast. And uh, and so I think that my, and also small town, I think that you can, you can partition off into like-minded, like-aged people when you live in a big city. Right. Um, if you're part of a church, you can go to a mega church and then hang out with all the single attractive people or the fat gamers or whatever. Like you can still find your tribe. But if you're in a small town, like you can't tribe up as easily, which is funny because small towns get pigeonholed as these places where everybody's closed minded. But really, it's way easier to close your mind when you can find lots of people who have their mind closed in the same way. Right. In a small town, you're going to church like you have a handful of people you can interact with. And so I think that was part of it. That's how you end up, you know, uh, having a lot of friends who are older people or different, you know, or families. I have friends who are just, you know, families with kids and I hang out with them. And so anyway, I think that I, when I went to Portland, there was such a, there's such a black and white view of, of, uh, especially of conservatives. And, um, I think I was still forming my opinions on that stuff, but the, the vilifying right. of that, because especially you know the old man that I went to breakfast with was one of the greatest people I knew and biggest heart on earth. But you know he would be take any sentence that he said, you could post it on Twitter, and he would be like instantly demolished. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, he, he'd be the new Hitler because you know, and uh, so yeah, I think I just I think it was that that helped. Was Young Life huge for your faith? Yeah, my. My parents had their own ideas of their faith. Like we went to a, a normal church, kind of a normal kind of like a community church. And then they divorced when I was eight. My mom took us to Catholic church on her weekends. And my dad, 
who was homeless, we'd sleep in his van with him and he'd take us to his Pentecostal church on his weekends. Wow. <laughs> so a very mixed up view of like what God was like and what Christianity was like. Wow. Man. But so I rejected it pretty early on, but then that young life was where I kind of came to it through uh, on my own terms. And my mom had actually stopped going to church that time. So I ended up getting the family to start going back to church through young life, uh, and through going to Young Life camp and stuff. So I got totally brainwashed by Young Life. Man, it happens. Uh, Young Life was huge when I was in school. So, <laughs> Oh, yeah? Um, oh, yeah. Like they did all the camps to Colorado, work camp in Colorado, or I think they called it work camp. Oh, yeah. Okay, now <laughs> you did Bear Mageddon, so I misspoke. Oh, yeah, so the Bears Want to Kill You, yeah, yeah. the other book. <laughs> that that one but came out Bears months ago. Yeah, so that came out because, you know, having a webcomic like Bear Mageddon, it's really hard to get people to check it out and try it out to get – because the way to get people to check things out on the internet is to make something people will share. Right. And most of the time people won't share a, a pick up like a page of a comic that's in the middle of a story. You know, it's like it needs to be a, a gag or something. So I started trying to make these kind of silly propaganda, uh, things about or safe bear safety, uh, images in a world of bear Mageddon really over the top and stupid. And, the things went viral. Like, you know, I'd had some that like went crazy viral. And so the goal was to like, at least some people would see that there is a, you know, you know, more on the bear, more on the bear apocalypse at this website or something. And you can go check out bear Mageddon and to kind of create branding around it. And those things became so popular. I, I created a side website, which was actually inspired by the Babylon B before I was actually part of the Babylon B oh, wow. called bear news.com. And so I started posting like onion style news articles that were only about bears killing everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so those, you know, and that's what kind of interests me into it, the whole world of internet. Uh, I don't know if marketing is the right word, but it was me trying to figure out my own marketing strategies to try to draw attention to my stuff. So I had things that would make the front page of Reddit and go crazy viral. And, and I really wanted to try a Kickstarter and so I decided I had all these bear meme things I'd done on this news site, and I had all these jokes. I could easily do more. It's, this is the stuff that flows out of me. And so I decided for my first Kickstarter I would do that book because it seemed to be people were most interested at the time, and I had a lot of material already. So so I did it. I had uh, always wanted to try to just self-publish my own book, and so that's what I did. And then can people get it's, that now? So you did it for Kickstarter, but is it available now? Yeah. It is still available. I have I I literally have two boxes left in my house, and you know those boxes hold like about thirty books each. Right. So I have like one is cut into, and I have another one. So I have like one full one left and one partial one. So they're almost out. Um, they'll probably be out by Christmas for sure. But uh, so yeah, in fact, if I do any kind of there, there's no sale going on from right now. So the moment I put some kind of sale on them, I, I haven't even really been mentioning them because they're almost gone. Yeah. <laughs> Until I come up with money to do another print run. That's going to be it. Unless you get, I did do the audiobook. It's not as animated as uh, <laughs> all you possum audiobook, but yeah, those print lines are real, huh? Oh yeah, I didn't really have a plan for once I sold out of them. I didn't, you know, I had, I never had a book that I printed myself where I sold more than a few hundred, and then this one I, I did like fifteen hundred, and I'm just about gone. So that's awesome, man. Congrats. Um, Thank you. so brave Ollie possum. Is this probably the first thing like your? Your poor wife, like, is she, what does she love? Most of the things you've mentioned are like Christian, white guy, male stuff. That's a, I'm, I'm <laughs> largely joking, but I mean, does she love Ollie Possum? Yeah, that was another thing that was cool about it was, it was really the first project that I did that, I mean, I don't even generally share my stuff with my wife. Like, I don't think she's ever read, uh, read a page of Bear Mageddon. She's read some Axe Cop because I think she found it interesting when she first met me. She showed it to her kids, and they loved it so much, and she kind of found it fascinating that they liked it so much. Um, but yeah, she's you know she she had never seen Star Wars when we met. Like she's uh, really not oh, wow. in the nerd culture. I mean, I, I'm already not that into Star Wars, but I at least know like if someone says the name Han Solo, what they're talking about. You right, know? <laughs> right, right. So she's so far removed from it. Uh, but yeah, it always felt like it's just my thing. When I made Ollie. Uh, yeah, that was one of the first things I did. I, I, I tried writing a few chapters. Originally, the very first chapter of the book was when the Glorch walks in, okay, to the restaurant, 
and sits down. Like I didn't have any lead up to that. I just had the chef is working and then she walks in. And so I had that chapter and I just wanted to get an opinion on it. So I, I handed it to my wife and she was, it's kind of one of the first times like I got feedback from her and she really liked it. And it's a project that she really loves. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, it's, it's a project that I love so much that even if nobody buys it, I'm just happy I did it. So <laughs> it's very close to my heart. It's just a labor of love. And I think, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I was very, very scared as a kid. Okay. So it comes from that too. Like my, when my parents divorced and my dad disappeared, like that's really frightening for a kid to really, you don't think that's a possibility that one of your parents could just go away. And, uh, that makes everything seem very insecure. And we had just moved to a small town and everything had gotten stolen out of our car. We were in this bad part of a neighborhood. Whoa. And so I had never even, I, it had never dawned on me that that could happen either, that someone could just, would just break into your car and steal everything. And that they could do that in your house too. And my dad's not there anymore. So I just like went into a couple of years worth of extreme nightmares and weird, uh, I'd hear things and my, my vivid imagination really worked against me during that time. But, uh, and at the time that I wrote this book, my stepson was having a lot of fears and he had kind of, you know, similar, I mean, his dad is still around and he's still, uh, you know, he's, he still, uh, visits him and stuff, but it's, it's still very uprooting and like, you know, sure. for a kid when, when your parents divorce and things that you, the things the way you thought they were supposed to always be like, aren't that way. And that security goes away. So I really wanted to write something that explored fear, uh, for him too when I wrote this book. I had one friend, Frank Fleming, who's a Babylon Bee writer. He said yeah. his daughter was going through fear, uh, keeping them up at night and stuff like that. And he said that this book actually <laughs> impacted her. And get, he said that it actually, they had conversations about about fear and stuff through reading the book together. And he said that since they read the book, I'm not, I'm not guaranteeing this can happen for everybody, but <laughs> she hasn't slept in their bed since. That's awesome, man. Now let's go with the guarantee. That's gonna. That's what's gonna sell yeah. these books. That's, that's right. <laughs> that's awesome, man. And it's. It sounds. It's funny too. You mentioned just. You mentioned with the uh, Frank Fleming and the Babylon Bee. It sounds like your whole life has led you to work at the Babylon Bee. <laughs> well, it is. It's really funny because when I moved out here to L.A., you know that was that's where I thought I was gonna live. I wanted to live in Glendale, you know, a few blocks down from DreamWorks and Disney and stuff like that, because that's where I my fate was that I thought and. I moved out here and couldn't find, I really couldn't land anything. And uh, eventually, I was really trying to find a wife too. I didn't want to be single and I was doing eHarmony. And when I found my wife, she's out here in Rancho Cucamonga, which is like, if you know the layout down here, it's like 50 miles away. Like nobody who works in Hollywood lives this far away from Hollywood because the <laughs> traffic's so bad down here. Okay. 50 miles is like, you know, easily a two or three hour drive. Uh, you know, it's a, quite a commute. So, uh, so anyway, I was just like, why the heck did I end up out here? And then when I found Kyle Mann of the Babylon Bee, he lived like five miles down the road of me, from me. Like the job I'm doing right now, I couldn't have been doing if I, you know, it wouldn't have happened if I didn't live out here. So it's one of those things that feels, feels somewhat like fate because uh, <laughs> it really worked out that we just go. happened to be from the same town, you know. Awesome, man. Well, hey, thank you again so much. Ollie Possum is at canonpress.com. I am going to be doing a special, like a Christmas. Uh, you can buy the book from uh, anywhere. So I'll offer this. To, if you already have the book, I'll offer this stuff in a package without the book. You can still get it. Um, but I'm going to do a special package that'll have a book called The Art of Ollie Possum, which is kind of like a 40 page uh, book that has. Um, th there's another hundred images, like drawings and sketches that never made it into the book. <laughs> right. Cause I changed the story so many times and I was so excited to start drawing it, <laughs> drawing and then I'm like, Oh wait, I got to change this. And I couldn't use the picture. So it look, it has like a, and I also wrote like an introduction. So, cause there's no introduction or, pre or preface or anything in the, in the actual book. So kind of it's some insight into the writing process and what inspired the book in there and little bit of commentary, but I, you know, it's just a thrown together sketchbook. Um, so that signed, uh, I'll do a drawing of an animal and, uh, and like probably in Sumi ink or something. Um, and there'll be a book plate, a signed book plate, signed and numbered and a bookmark. I think that's it. I might throw in my other, I have another kid's book. Uh, that's a small kind of silly book called I name my toys, Alex, and I might throw in too. 
So it'll just be like a package, uh, a fun limited edition package. And if you don't, if you if you buy Ollie or if you already got Ollie Possum or Brave Ollie Possum, then I'll just I can sell you that package with the book plate signed that you can stick into your book. Um, so you can still get your book signed even if you've already bought it. Excellent. And we'll make sure all of that info is easy to find in some place folks can see it. I'm, I'm still ordering all this stuff. So, yeah, it's something I wanted to have available for Christmas season. Awesome, man. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, man. And we will announce – well, I'm, we'll have a big announcement about the audiobook when it's ready to go. Cool. Awesome. All Sweet, right. Thank man. you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>